Welcome to our second edition of Theological Journals, or part two, that is. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? We pick up now with the Reformed Presbyterian Journal of 1837, and the editor is describing the true Christian characterized. As to essentials, God has given in his word no truth that is not a part of the system of revealed religion. And so every truth is essential to the beauty and symmetry of the whole. And though a good man is ignorant of much that God has made known, yet no one may reject any truth, however men call it circumstantial or by any other epithet of reproach. As to fundamental truths, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple of the Lord, Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. In this text, the apostles and prophets are words designating the whole doctrine which they taught. All the truths taught by them are in the foundation and in this view are fundamental. He who removes one of these foundation stones in so far weakens the edifice. This noise, for it is nothing more relative to essentials and circumstantials, is designed to sow pillows under the armholes. It endangers the souls of men by teaching them lightly to esteem the doctrines of the apostles and prophets. And it corrupts the church by bringing into her communion the ignorant, the unstable, the erroneous, and the unholy. Number two, saving faith in the promises. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We're saving faith no more than the ascent of understanding to the truth of all that is revealed in this gospel. This, our second characteristic of a true Christian, would be identical with the first. But though there is no exercise of justifying faith without a holy perception of the truth and ascent to it by the understanding, Yet much more is required in order to the existence of that grace of the Spirit. Were the mere belief of the truth of the proposition, he that believeth shall be saved, all that is meant by the word believeth in the text, it would require very little self-examination in many, perhaps in most cases, to ascertain whether one was a true believer or not. Perhaps most men who give any reflection to the subject know what they think as to the truth of the proposition, and yet thousands, both of the regenerate and regenerate, have doubted as to the reality of saving faith. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. We'll pick that up in our next installment as we turn to Reverend the Princeton Reviewers on ecclesiastical organizations. There are no doubt many persons who suppose there is an obligation on Presbyterians to sustain the boards of their own church, arising out of the general duty of members of a communion to the body to which they belong, or from the supposed superiority of these boards to the wisdom or fidelity with which they are conducted. This is a very different thing from resting this obligation on ecclesiastical authority. We are also aware that many who some years ago cheerfully voted to recommend the Home Missionary Society would not do so now, simply because they believe that this society has, under the management of the present secretary, become a great party engine and is operating in a manner most unfriendly to the best interests of the church. This again is a very different thing from opposition to that institution founded on the assumption that a voluntary society has no right to engage in the work of missions. The people of God then, or the church in the wide sense of the term, 
are bound to do all they can to evangelize the world. One of the most important means to be employed for this purpose is the sending abroad among the destitute and heathen preachers of the gospel. In conducting this work, there is part which the church in her organized capacity is alone authorized to perform, and there is a secular part which may be performed either by voluntary associations or by boards ecclesiastically appointed and controlled. Our decided preference is for the latter, and it is a preference which every year's experience tends to confirm. But let us hear the objections which our author has to urge against such ecclesiastical operations. Quote, for church courts to assume the control and direction of missionary operations and disbursements, he tells us, is an attempt to subject to ecclesiastical legislation that which the great head of the church has left to the unbiased decisions of every man's conscience. He has not authorized any ecclesiastical tribunal to assess the amount of each one's contribution, nor to prescribe the objects or modes of its administration. Close quote. This objection is founded on a mere assertion and on a most extraordinary one the appointment of a board of missions by a church court involves a set of, we'll let it populate, an act of legislation as to the amount of each contribution and makes almsgiving a matter of law. We'll pick that up in our next round. As we turn to Concordia Theological Chapter, Theological journal in this article by, forget his name, president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on Herman Sass. Sass was convinced that in this American milieu, where the Protestants were compromised by the secular sacred mishmash of the social gospel movement, which distorted the office of ministry. And the Roman Catholics by Marian dogmas, the false dogmas of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Mary, Paul promulgated without the slightest biblical warrant. Only Lutherans were in a position to, to pose the question of truth unto repentance. Sass later wrote that it was in the U.S. where he read the Lutheran Confessions and Wilhelm Lowe's The Three Books About the Church and became a convinced confessional Lutheran. Quote, Personally, I must confess that it was in America that I first learned to fully appreciate what it means to be loyal to the Lutheran confessions. But for what I learned from the Lutheran theologian and church bodies in the United States, I could probably never have written this book faith and order. Sasa had ent entered the ecumenical movement in a large way through his doctor father, Adolf Deisman. Ronald R. Feuerhahn has demonstrated that Sass was the most active continental theologian in the faith and order movement prior to World War II. Sass held positions on the Continuation Committee Executive Committee and Committee of Reference. Sass was chosen to be the editor of the official German report of the Los Wayne Conference, 1927. That document provided numerous reports on lectures and discussions of Das Geschlechte am der Kirche, the sacred office of the church, dealing with ecumenically press pressing questions who ordains, what of bishops, church order, grades of one office. In the wake of La Swain, several essays flowed from Sass's pen, which are of fundamental significance for his understanding of the office. In his essay, Curios, Sasse claims that the New Testament 
witnesses to the divinity of Christ, but asserts that only by starting from the dogma of the divinity of the Holy Spirit may the church escape from the cloud of religious historical hypotheses to a new understanding of the resurrection and so also to new Christology. And that would be a high Christology of the ancient church, a living Christ to whom his church prays and who is in the church's midst that this Christ is not an intermediate being, but where Deus. And now for Princeton uh, Protestant Reformed Theological Journal, uh, Brendan is dealing with the neo kyperian theology of glory and the uh, Reformed higher education. The neo kyperian vision represents a degenerated version of Reformed theology that naturally tends toward world conf confirmation. If wonder, one wonders how we have gotten to a place in history where the affirmation of LB, LGBTQ plus lifestyles is ardently promoted on Christian campuses the answer can be found in the principles upon which these institutions were built. In the disputation, Luther predicted exactly what would happen when the theology of glory was the founding principle. A theology of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theology of cross calls the thing what it actually is. If Reformed Christians refuse to call sin what it is actually, we have the world at our fingertips in all its glory. But if we do call sin what it actually is, we can expect to carry a cross. And so the Lord reminds us, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. We'll pick this up next time as we turn to the Reformed Theological Journal on uh, Reformed Faith and Practice of 2020, an article on the male ordinate, male diac diaconate. Seeing Acts 6, 1 to 6 is the institution of the office of deacon is justified. Some have pushed back by noting, number one, that two of the seven, Stephen and Philip have word ministry gifts, monetary and mon and two monetary gifts for the poor are given to the Jerusalem elders, not deacons. The response is that the New Covenant Church is in its beginning stages. It is not unusual for some deacons to have and exercise other gifts simultaneously. And two, it is not unusual to give a monetary gift initially to the elders before it's distributed as they are designated rulers. With the conclusion that Acts 6, 1 to 6 refers to the office of deacon, the issue of women in the diaconate comes to the fore. The congregation was instructed to choose seven men on air. The Greek on air refers to male as opposed to female and is not generic man, mankind, often anthropos. It is noted that males were chosen despite the immediate need being for widowers and women. For many, the requirement to choose male settles the question of women deacons in favor of a male only ordained diaconate. And now for Southwest Theological Journal dealing with Hebrews, the epistles of the Hebrews in the Old Testament. This can only be illustrated briefly with the use of Psalm 95 in Hebrews 3 and 4. Entering the land is clearly understood as a type of entering the promised rest in Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13 connection between the land and rest is firmly established in the Old Testament. Yet by appropriating Psalm 95, a later reflection on the wilderness generation's failure to enter the land, the author draws out implications about the nature of God's rest 
and entering that rest which would not have been possible had he relied only on the Pentateuchal narratives. From Psalm 95, the author shows uh, that the promised rest was not ultimately fulfilled either by the entry into the land by Joshua or its eventual occupation by David. Moreover, by connecting the expression, my rest, in Psalm 95 with God's creation in Genesis 2-2, the author can develop a typological trajectory concerning the promised rest, katapausis, that began at creation and extends forever to the eschaton. Number four, prosopological exegesis. The phenomena and prevalence of divine speech in Hebrews is often noted. Indeed, 11 of the 13 chapters in Hebrews include examples of divine speech. Moreover, the fact that the Father and the Son speak to each other in Hebrews has often been observed. We'll pick this up next time. Princeton Theological Review, the name of the book is James Cohn said I wasn't going to tell nobody. The nonviolent protests led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Black Power Movement headed by Malcolm X inspired Cohn in his theological writings. He notes how they disagreed on their approaches to black liberation. For example, Cohn claims King was greatly disturbed about unrest in the cities and the rhetoric of black power, which reminded him of the violent language of Malcolm X. Cohn believed the two moments, movements could be reconciled, explaining how he never thought of black power in terms of violence and hate. Rather, it expressed the necessity of black people asserting their dignity in the face of 350 years of white supremacy. Cohn goes on to provide ample evidence of the hypocrisy of American and European theologians in the midst of racial inequality. These men interpreted and preached the gospel in a way that ignores society's systematic denial of the people's humanity. He decries the irony of a church that preaches the message of Christ's love while simultaneously infringing on the rights of black people. Cohn cites Karl Barth as an exact example of the harm abstract theologizing can have on black communities. Instead of <coughs> adopting Barth's infinite qualitative distinction between God and the human being, Cohn uses the suffering of Jesus <clears throat> as an example of God's identification with the poor and powerless. He then analyzes Luke's gospel definition of Isaiah 61.1, which speaks of liberation for the poor and oppressed. These examples are used to show how white European theology had become abstracted from the black community. In addition, Cohn examines theologians Reinald Niebuhr and Paul Tillich. Both men taught at Union, and Cohn describes them as white theologians who neglected to address black suffering. He says Niebuhr had expressed no moral outrage against lynching or segregation, even though he lived during that era. Cohn then asked Professor James Luther Adams, why didn't Tillich talk about racism in the United States in the same way he opposed Nazism in Germany? Adams said Tillich was asked a similar question and replied that his American audience would reject him. The lack of concern over white supremacy in American churches leads to Cohn's rejection of these figures' theologies as foundational. He argues for a new way of doing theology from the bottom and not the top, addressing the plight of black people. 
Cohn goes on to describe the black Christ, a liberating figure representing black power in the gospel. Christ is black, he claims, because to be black means that your heart, your soul, your mind, and your body are where the dispossessed are. According to Cohn, this symbolic identification with the oppressed lies at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We kind of missed the book of Romans, didn't we? If the black liberation movement represented Christ's message, Cohn argues, it necessarily means the white church is the antichrist. His claim doesn't refer to individual people. It represents the destructive nature of white supremacy in American churches. He goes on to say white supremacy is the antichrist here in America because it has killed and crippled tens of millions of black bodies and minds in the modern world. It found every aspect of human life, especially churches, seminaries, and theology. We'll continue the book review in our next occasion as we take up Leviticus and Christ in Thamelios. The Laws of Honor. Having identified the Laws of Honor, chapters 23 to 27, is a unit within the structure of Leviticus. We have been able to recognize their role in the theology of the book. The laws of approach play a role in Israel becoming holy through God's presence among them. The laws of life outline their responsibility in maintaining this holy status. And the laws of honor show them how to live out this holy status, calling them to honor God with what is theirs and what God has given them. Now, the way a holy status is lived out is always connected with the way in which it is established, as we see with the priest who lives out his holiness by performing the very duties he was set about to do. In Israel's case, they live out their holiness by living out their new identity as God's routine people called to live with him in the promised land. Similar to Israel, believers today are redeemed to belong to God and are called, therefore, to honor him above all else. As Paul urges the Corinthians, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Later in the same letter, he exhorts them, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, 1031. Unlike Israel, however, Christ did not merely redeem us from a foreign nation, but from sin itself. And he did not merely secure a life with God in a temple external to ourselves, but a life with God who indwells us by his spirit. So the redemption and life we find in Christ are fully filled out versions of the redemption and life originally granted to Israel. The consequence of this is that when it comes to their fulfillment in Christ, the laws of honor are similar to the laws of life. Their purpose remains applicable after Christ but their expression in terms of the old covenant realities need to be reckoned with when working out that application. Specifically, the laws of honor more closely resemble the non-purity laws of life, since Christ has filled the redemption and life of God's people and thereby radically altered the way to live out that redeemed life. Consider, for example, the Levitical calendar, Leviticus 23. The weekly Sabbath was a way for Israel to remember and celebrate God's sanctification of them by his life with them in the temple in the promised land. Similarly, the annual festivals were ways for Israel to remember and celebrate God's redemption of them for the land in which he was to give them. We'll pick that up in the next edition. We turn now to the Journal of Theological Studies to see if this writer is making any progress here.
in the progress of religion, the reverse is the case. There is less interest in the accumulation of particulars than in the change in the human mind itself. And the new attitude which is taken from entering into this religious heritage or from holding it with greater intensity. The opinion of others may be taken up and verified as fresh conviction by other men. This living consciousness is the outcome of religious progress, not embodied in storehouses of information. We made a mistake there. But diffused in many forms of expression and exemplified and appropriated in persons so that they are transformed by the renewing of their mind. Men thus come to know themselves as parts of a moral and spiritual world Whereas in scientific advance, we continue to look at the order as external to ourselves. The religious consciousness, there's a new creation. It follows from this that while science can never be complete, religion has attained its highest form. There must always be new particulars to be observed and examined and described by science that the religious consciousness may reach the final form of which it is capable under mundane conditions. We habitually recognize this about the philosophic and artistic consciousness, much as we may admire Mr. Herbert Spencer, Mr. Whistler, Mr. Bernard Shaw. We do not necessarily think them greater as philosophers and artists than Plato, Valasquez, and Shakespeare. In the capacity for thinking and feeling and expressing thought and feeling in appropriate forms, the men of the present day do not seem to excel those of some periods of the past. In the same sort of way, there may have been the most complete apprehension possible to man of the relation between human will and divine and the most perfect harmony between the two. As Christians, we hold that this may not only be so, but that it has been so, and that in the person of the man Jesus Christ, the human religious consciousness attained its perfect type. In him, there was not only conviction of ultimate intimate union with the eternal God, but a unique power of expressing the content of his consciousness in word and action. The content of his consciousness is most fully exhibited to us in the Gospel of John. In reading it, we may feel his perfect sense of union with the Father, his perfect confidence in offering himself as the ideal for his brother men, and his readiness to train them through the gift of his Holy Spirit. We'll resume that later as we turn to guilt, demoralizing guilt. Thanks in part to Freud's influence, we live in a therapeutic age. Nothing illustrates the fact more clearly than the striking ways in which the sources of guilt's power and the nature of its would-be antidotes have changed us. Freud sought to relieve in his patients the worst mental burdens and pathologies imposed by their oppressive and hyperactive consciences, which he renamed their superegos, while deliberately refraining from rendering any judgment as to whether the guilt feelings ordained by those punitive superegos had any moral justification. In other words, he sought to release the patient from guilt's crushing hold by disarming and setting aside guilt's moral significance <clears throat> and redesignated it as just another psychological phenomenon whose proper functioning could be ascertained by its effect on one's general well-being. He sought to demoralize guilt by treating it as a strict subjective and emotional matter. Health was the only remaining criteria for success or failure in therapy, 
and health was a functional category, not an ontological one. And the non-judgmental therapeutic worldview whose seeds Freud planted has come into full power in the mainstream sensibility of modern America, which in turn has profoundly affected the standing and meaning of the most venerable among our moral transactions and not merely matters of guilt. For example, the various ways in which forgiveness is now understood. Forgiveness is one of the chief antidotes to the forensic stigma of guilt and as such has been one of the golden words of our culture with particularly deep roots in the Christian tradition in which the capacity for forgiveness is seen as a central attribute of the deity itself. In the face of our shared human frailty, forgiveness expresses a kind of transcendent and unconditional regard for humanity of the other free of any interest or mixture of punitive anger or puffed up self-righteousness. Yet forgiveness rightly understood can never deny the reality of justice. To forgive whether one forgives trespasses or debts means abandoning the just claims we have against others in the name of a higher ground of love. Forgiveness affirms justice, even in the act of suspending it. It is rare because it is so costly. We turn now to seed and harvest. And we got a letter from the chairman of the board of Trinity Episcopal School of Ministry. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Energy, boundless energy, commitment, sacrifice, family, vision, hospitality, fellowship, generosity, the Pittsburgh Kneelers, the Trophimus Center, community, love, faith. These are just a few words to describe the very Reverend Dr. Lori and Mary Thompson. 25 years of serving, teaching, giving, and leading a school is quite a remarkable legacy. Trinity School for Ministry is blessed with many great leaders and benefactors. Few have shaped the school and community more than Lori and Mary Thompson. In fact, it will be difficult to imagine the TSM experience without Lori and Mary bow ties or the bright yellow smart car in the parking lot. Laurie has informed the Board of Trustees of his intention to step down from his role as Dean President at the end of graduation May 2022. Laurie will then have fulfilled his commitment to serve five years as the Dean President. We are in his debt. These have not been especially easy years, especially the last two working through the global pandemic. Through grace, grit, and an unshakable faith and love of Jesus Christ, Lori never flinched or backed away. In fact, just the opposite. He leaned in just as he did as a college lacrosse goalie. When the Lord called Lori and Mary to serve, he called the perfect team for the difficult season he knew to which he would be moving. I truly believe the school is now transitioning from winter to spring and soon a glorious summer. Thank you, God. Thank you, Thompsons. The board now has the important responsibility of finding and appointing Laurie's successor. We are well prepared and resourced for this. First, we acknowledge God is in charge here. A search process and plan has been organized and a top-notch search committee has been formed. I'm very pleased to announce that the Most Reverend Robert Duncan, founding Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America, has agreed to serve as chair of the search committee. Additionally, Dr. Sarah Lebhar Hall TSM01MDiv, 
adjunct professor of Hebrew and Hebrew Bible, Gordon Conwell and Trinity School of Ministry, has graciously agreed to serve as the vice chair. We're proud to announce that the members of the search committee to the left of the page, which include faculty, alumni, staff, and outside constituents. An outline of important dates and an overview of the process for submitting applications and nominations is on our website. On behalf of the board search committee and the school, I do ask for your prayers. I have no doubt that the Lord will guide and reveal the right candidate to be our next leader. However, we must pray, listen, and respond to every step along the way. As you know, it all starts and ends with him. I look forward to keeping you well informed. As we know that all things, that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. And now for the Dean Search Committee, it's got Bob Duncan, Dr. Blackburn, Dr. Donison, Dr. Jessica Jones, Bishop Mark Lawrence, Betsy Lewis, uh, Doug Wicker, Dalton Ziegler, Dr. Nay, Weber Hall, Reverend Albert, Reverend Hughes, Reverend Wong, David Xanthora, close, close constituency, Canon Andrew Gross, Reverend Dave Hankey, Elaine Lucci, and that is that. And we will pick up now with looking forward to this. Reform Faith and Journal Shall Fundamentalism Win a Centennial Symposium. This May marks the 100th anniversary of the sermon preached by Harry Emerson Fosdick, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? We offer five reflections on the sermon, its role in the Presbyterian controversy in the early 20th century, and the lesson it bears for Presbyterians in the 21st century by Kelvin DeYoung. Henry Emerson Fosdick in the Spirit of American Liberalism, the Foreign Theological Seminary of Charlotte. On May 21, 1922, Henry Emerson Fosdick took to the pulpit of Old First, the historic First Presbyterian Church established 1716, located on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan to deliver what would be his most famous sermon. The American Church broadly and the Presbyterian Church more specifically were already divided into conservative and liberal camps. Fosdick's sermon did not create this theological and ecclesiastical division, but his sermon that spring clearly exposed the division, and more than that, it exemplified all the reasons for it. For as much as Fosdick thought of himself as an ironic, moderate, and peace-loving one, one does not untitle a sermon, shall the fundamentalists win, without meaning to pick a fight a sermon for the times. The text for Fosdick's sermon that morning came from Acts 5, 38 to 39, where the esteemed Gamaliel, a leader of the Jewish Sanhedrin, counsels an angry mob to leave the apostles alone. For if their work be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Whether Fosdick fancied himself a Gamaliel or not, he considered the Pharisees' words from the first century to be a model for the 20th. What the church needed more than ever was a spirit of liberality and tolerance. In particular, this meant a spirit of charity towards the multitude of reverent Christians who had been unable to keep this new knowledge about science, history, and religion in one compartment of their minds and the Christian religion in another. 
and affirming the aphorism cantankerousness is worse than Hank heterodoxy. Bostick argued that the worst kind of church that can be offered to the allegiance of the new generation is an intolerant church, shall the fundamentalists win. And we draw this to a close. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.